day. Okay, it's recording. All right, well, greetings everybody uh, from the Naval Academy's Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership. I'm Ed Barrett, uh, the center's research director. Thank you for attending this inquiry into the challenges besetting liberal democracies with Dr. Patrick Deneen of the University of Notre Dame and Dr. Peter Berkowitz of the Hoover Institution. The Stockdale Center annually examines an ethics topic relevant to military operations through its research seminar and McCain conference. Given rising doubts about the ability of human rights to guide national and international affairs, last year's topic was the foundations and future of human rights. Unfortunately, COVID forced us to cancel last March's conference but because concerns about the viability of liberalism have only intensified since last March, we wanted to revisit these issues. So this week's focus is on uh, liberal regimes, which for years have struggled to address economic inequalities, anti-elite populisms on the left and right, uh, identity-based politics, and then debt and unfunded liabilities. And then new concerns include violent protests, a contested election, and a lackluster pandemic response. So this afternoon, we'll focus on three questions, uh, basic questions. What problems afflict liberal democracies? What are their causes? And what can be done? So professors Deneen and Berkowitz, thank you for joining us today to begin the process of saving our republic. <laughs> Well, we'll see what we can do. See what we can do. Uh, right. Well, thanks very much, Colonel uh, Barrett, for uh, for hosting us. Uh, I was to be one of the speakers at the conference that was canceled last spring. Much to my much to my great regret, I would have very much enjoyed uh, visiting the Naval Academy. Uh, yeah, we were and, both looking forward to having you. Yeah, we. Uh, uh, I was actually going to visit with my daughter, and she was going to take a look at St. John's. So. Uh, wow. Um, so that was uh, doubly disappointing for both of us. Uh, but I am, I am very glad to be with, with you today, with your students and with my old friend, uh, uh, not old in years, uh, but, older, <laughs> uh, but uh, 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 someone I've known a long time, Peter Berkowitz, uh, who we, we, used, we used to uh, uh, do a bit of teaching together at uh, Georgetown University and I'd see him more often when I was in DC, not as, not as frequent these days. So it's good to see you, Peter. Good to see you, um, Patrick. So I guess I'll just set the table and, and, and Peter can devour the feast that I'll leave for him uh, <laughs> uh, or spit it out as the case may be. Uh, let, since since the, the, the challenge that's been presented is a challenge of liberal democracy, it's worth starting there. What is, what is liberal democracy? And we could spend the entire afternoon uh, discussing uh, you know, what liberal democracy is, but it, we could say in very, very basic and summary terms that liberal democracy attempts to put together two deep uh, values and two deep um, devotions that human beings have held over much of the history of humanity. The one of which is a love for freedom, which you see embodied in the, uh, or captured in the word liberty, uh, liberal, which has as its root, uh, the word liberty. And the other is a love of equality, uh, a love uh, for, uh, especially a desire to be treated equally uh, to be um, uh, conferred equal dignity, both politically and beyond the political sphere. And we, in some ways you could say liberal democracy is a great experiment of putting these two things together uh, that uh, uh, have not often been twinned. They've often been pursued individually as separately. Uh, Greek democracy, for example, prized equality among citizens, but it wasn't really very good about uh, liberty of citizens, uh, much less those who were non-citizens. As a result, liberal, liberal democracy, because it holds these two values in some ways an equal devotion, uh, it, um, it generates, it tends to generate two parties. Uh, and this ought to be familiar to us. Those two parties uh, are typically the party of, who sort of sides, uh, uh, prefers or defends liberty, uh, sometimes at the expense of equality, uh, and the party that prizes equality, uh, sometimes uh, at the greater expense of liberty. And in our political system, those who we uh, regard as the greater defenders of the liberty side of the equation, we, we call them conservatives uh, or Republicans. Uh, but um, for much of recent history, we, we could better describe them as classical liberals, as uh, defenders of the 
worldview that in many ways was, was introduced and defended by uh, thinkers like John Locke in the early modern period and, uh, and our founding fathers who were, uh, many of whom were, were uh, devotees and in many ways intellectual heirs of this tradition. And then on the side of the party of equality, we, you know, we typically call that party the Democratic Party, the pro progressives. Uh, these are the party of Jefferson, who in various moments, at least, sometimes he was more on the side of the party of liberty. Uh, but for much of his political life, he, was, uh, 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 he sided with the, the, the party uh, of, of equality. Now, these two sides, these two sides of the, of the liberal coin have contested with each other. Uh, and we could, we, could, we could write a history of America and histories of America have been written that have sort of showed the way that this debate has, has unfolded. Um, but one thing that I think uh, we begin to note today is that there's a way uh, that these aspects of these two parties have increasingly coalesced or that to, to put it a different way, the, the purpose or ends of liberal democracy have increasingly collided and become more singular in, in the modern period and in, in more recent periods in that both parties increasingly seem to prize a kind of a combination of equal liberty, a form of equal liberty. Then they might differ on the means of achieving that, uh, how we best achieve that. One side arguing it's through the marketplace, the other side arguing it's through the intervention of the market. And this, this accords with an argument um, that uh, probably my favorite thinker, Peter won't be surprised uh, at this, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville noted. Uh, now Tocqueville has a very famous chapter in, in his great book, Democracy in America that conservatives usually really love because he, he says, look, liberal democracies are gonna probably often uh, prefer equality over liberty. And this, this worries him. But he, at the beginning of that chapter, the chapter um, is, um, uh, the title is a long one. It's uh, How a Democratic Peoples Will Come to Prefer Equality Over Liberty, I think it is. It's, it's uh, part two, uh, chap uh, I'm sorry, volume two, part two, chapter one. He actually begins that chapter by noting that there's a kind of telos to liberal democracy. And if it's sort of left to its own devices, it will, it will move in this direction. It will move toward this sort of final end or logic of liberal democracy. And he says that the, that the telos of liberal democracy, as he writes, and I'm gonna quote him, is to move toward the most complete form that equality can take on earth, right? So not a partial form of equality, but the most complete form that equality can take on earth. And this idea of complete is very Aristotelian, right? The full realization of its sort of telos, its end. And he says that this condition, this most complete form of equality that liberal democracy can take on earth, he writes, and I quote again, can be imagined as an extreme point at which freedom and equality touch each other and intermingle, in which they become in some ways fused together. These two things that form, you know, typically form two parties will become sort of fused together. And he says, this is the kind of condition that, that, it, that, get, that it gives rise to. And I quote again, then with none differing from those like them, no one will be able to exercise a tyrannical power. Men will be perfectly free because they will be entirely equal. And they will be perfectly equal because they will be entirely free. This is the ideal toward which democratic peoples tend. This is, this, this is you know, there, there might be times when there's, we, we think we're pursuing more equality, more liberty. Uh, they tend to balance each other. They tend to oscillate. But as an overall trajectory, liberal democracies aim toward this telos of perfect equality and perfect li liberty that touch each other and intermingle in which we are no longer see ourselves as governed arbitrarily by any other person. Uh, and thus we are perfectly free and perfectly equal. Well, this is Tocqueville suggests that this is sort of the trajectory of democracy. And in the chapter that follows this chapter, I think the sequence is, is quite uh, intentional uh, and purposive on Tocqueville's part. The chapter that follows is called Of Individualism in Democratic Countries. So the, the way in which this equal liberty will manifest itself is in this form of individualism that I think we find to be very familiar in the American context. The more that we're liberated from any arbitrary form of governance over not just political matters and political affairs, but arbitrary governance over who we are, the kind of human being that I think of myself, the kind of human being that I want to become, right? The, 
you know, what's the biggest section of any bookstore, at least for adults, if, if there are bookstores anymore? It's typically the self-help section, right? It's the section of the, the, the bookstore where, you know, I want to be something else this week. And so I'm going to go and get a book and find out how to be the thing that I want to be. So to be completely free to be the self-making creature, Tocqueville says this is the kind of aim or point of liberal democracy. But to free ourselves completely, we need not just to be free from arbitrary rule of government, some of the, you know, one of the things that the founding fathers were concerned especially about, but to be free of any kind of arbitrary form of identity that's forced upon us, that's foisted upon us. And so a liberal democracy will increasingly achieve a kind of equal liberty when people free themselves of any unchosen inheritance, for example. I don't, I don't have to be the religion of my parents or my, my ethnicity. I don't have to be, I don't have to accept the cultural traditions that I happen to come from. I don't have to, uh, you know, um, you know uh, accept the, the uh, whatever it is that, uh, that my parents expect me to be when I grow up or the person I'm supposed to marry. So, I, and I think you see this kind of sense of individualism articulated in, in great, you know, to, to great extent in our time and place. That the note that the nature of being both free and equal is this capacity to be the self-making, self-fashioning human being, but it requires the creation. And here, uh, you know, the left and the right, in some ways, you could say, work together in creating the conditions for the realization of this kind of human being. Right? I mean, this kind of human being doesn't just pop up like mushrooms, although Thomas Hobbes claims that they do. But in fact, it takes a pretty tremendous architecture, a pretty tremendous uh, sort of architecture of politics and economics and social forms to free us from the things that we might happen to have been born with uh, or uh, happen to inherit or otherwise might have inherited uh, from where we came from. And when Tocqueville writes of individualism, he compares it to the situation or condition of an aristocracy. So an aristocracy, you know, you, you, you're sort of, you, you, you are what you inherit. You're, liter you're literally the, uh, whatever you, your parents literally give you. I mean, look at Tocqueville's name, right? Alexis de Tocqueville. He is of Tocqueville, of the place Tocqueville, which is still a really nice manor in the Western part of France. And he's also of the family Tocqueville. That's, that's in some ways what defines him. And if you think about it, you know, last names, surnames always were reflections of this fact. So if you were a Smith or if you were a weaver or if you were a tailor, you kind of knew what you were. Or if you were, uh, you know, in my, in my tribe, my clan Irish, if your name started with an O or an MC, that meant of, you're of that person. Or if you're Scandinavian and your name ends with son, like Anderson uh, or Johansson, you know who you're from. Literally, who you are is defined by where you're from. And as a result, aristocracy, Tocqueville points out, uh, binds generations and binds people really closely together. And he says, this is, has some good things because then we have a sense of obligation and a sense of duty and a sense of gratitude toward what we've inherited. But it also can be constraining because it doesn't, you know, I don't wanna be a Smith. I don't wanna be a Taylor, right? I wanna be Taylor Swift. I don't wanna be Taylor, the guy that hems pants. So the problem with aristocracy is it binds us too close together. And this is how Tocqueville describes aristocracy. Aristocracy had made a chain of all the members of the community from the peasant to the king. Uh, so that it, it binds us and this image of chain is probably chosen with some deliberateness uh, that it's both something that links us and that's in some ways good, but it also binds us. We can't get, off, get out of the chain. It's very hard to delink yourself from the rest of the chain. On the other hand, democracy shatters the chain, right? This is it, it, liberal democracy shatters the chain and equal liberty is that freedom, right? To be my own link. Right, to, to be the, the link of the chain that I'm not bound to any other part of the chain. And this is how, how Tocqueville describes this condition. He says, democracy breaks that chain and severs every link of it. And he concludes this chapter with a kind of haunting passage. He says, thus, not only does democracy make every man forget his ancestors, but it hides his descendants and separates his contemporaries from him. It throws him back forever upon himself alone and threatens in the end to confine himself entirely within the solitude of his own heart. So we've achieved a kind of liberation through this form of equal liberty, a freedom from the rest of the chain, but it comes at an extreme price. First of all, a kind of social price that he notes then throughout the rest of the remainder of his book, 
which is the price in which we are no longer are able to conceive or even act upon an understanding of the common good. And, and our capacity uh, to act on behalf of the good of the community really begins to diminish to the point in which it disappears. And it also comes with terrible psychic costs. And maybe these costs that we're experiencing now are particularly keen in light of COVID. But these, he, uh, Tocqueville suggests that COVID is a kind of, sort of makes those already existing conditions even more extreme. The sense of isolation, the sense of aloneness, the sense that I'm, I'm in it alone, I'm on my own. Uh, this is a keen sense that, uh, that modern liberal Democrats feel if you live in a successful liberal democracy, that you are entirely on your own. And that's why the self-help section is so important for us because I have to, I have to make my own, my own way and chart my own path. There's one other uh, major um, consequence of this that Tocqueville points to, and I'll just I'll mention this and then I'll, 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 I'll stop, which is that it generates a new kind of aristocracy. And this is the irony, is this ambition for equal liberty of liberating us from any chain, any part of the chain. Now not just liberates us to be equally free, but it liberates us now to be the person that I aim to be, the, to pursue the path that I want to pursue. And again, all of us benefit in certain ways uh, and distinct ways from this. If, if, you know, if I grew up in Ireland of a century ago, I'd be an exceptionally mediocre potato farmer. Uh, but because I live in a liberal democracy, I'm at least an exceptionally mediocre college professor. Uh, so, so there is a great liberation that's involved uh, with, with being freed from these chains. But one of its consequences is to, is to create what Tocqueville describes as a new kind of aristocracy. Those who are able to exceed or excel, especially uh, in those areas that society values. And he says in democracies, liberal democracies is gonna be in the material realm. It's not gonna be priests, it's not gonna be prophets, it's not gonna be soothsayers. Um, it's going to be people who can do well economically. And those people are going to distinguish themselves in contrast to those who don't distinguish themselves. And he says this new aristocracy will of course be very dynamic and it will be very, um, you know, sort of will, will really affect a major shaping force on the society and generate a very dynamic society. One he describes in various places as restless, a society that's not able to rest very easily. But he goes on in a, in a chapter that I think doesn't get as much attention as it should. Uh, it's in part two, uh, volume two, part one, chapter 20. So at the very end of this chapter that I'm of this section of the book that I'm talking about. The trajectory of this individualism is to create what he calls a new aristocracy, which he says in some respects will be even worse than the old aristocracy. This new aristocracy, I think he's anticipating what we today call a meritocracy. This new aristocracy will no longer feel any sense of obligation or duty or gratitude to where they came from or to the people they left behind or those that they've, that they've excelled beyond. They will believe themselves to achieve their condition, their unequal condition entirely through, uh, through their own mm -hmm. achievements, through their own accomplishments, right? That you get into Harvard, you get into Yale and Princeton through your own hard work. Uh, and you have really only your hard work and effort to thank uh, and to acknowledge. Tocqueville actually says this new aristocracy will be in fact worse than the old aristocracy because it will break down the kinds of formal and informal bonds that tied the peasant to the king, that tied the community together, that left, left one in the, with the view that no matter what position I hold in society, I didn't, I didn't achieve this in some ways entirely on my own, and I'm not entirely delinked from the rest of humanity. He says, as a result, this new aristocracy will tend to say, I don't have any personal obligations to these people, these people who are not as fortunate as I am. So it will leave them to the care of the public, of the public sector. It will become very supportive of the idea of welfare, public welfare, because it will leave the new aristocracy free to pursue uh, the kinds of activities that they wish to do. And so there's no coincidence when we look at today's politics that those who are typically the wealthiest in our society and the most successful are also, also the most sort of socially liberal when it comes to sort of government welfare policy. And this is not necessarily because they're deep, more deeply charitable as it is a kind of way to sort of, as Tocqueville explains it, is to sort of defend their position as a class uh, and uh, to avoid the kind of, um, uh, the, 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 the kind of instability uh, that the lower class can typically um, uh, uh, 
give, uh, give rise to in, in a deeply unequal society. So I'll, I'll just close by saying that what, one of the things that seems to me that we're facing in our politics today, and very keenly, is exactly this condition that Tocqueville predicts uh, is the trajectory of liberal democracy, one in which we are increasingly freed from those kinds of bonds, those, those, the, the kind of chain uh, of which we might once have thought of ourselves as links within. Uh, but as a result, it's created a deep and profound and, and increasingly um, destabilizing uh, uh, politics uh, and a divide in our politics that few of us really know how to redress. And so I, I, I suppose one way to begin thinking about how to redress this would be, how does one, uh, how does one confront uh, the, the, the reasons or the causes for this new aristocracy in particular? Uh, and one proposal that seems to be widespread, especially on the more progressive left, is that either you have a kind of welfare system that takes care of everyone, or you have an educational system in which everyone will be able to rise to the level of the aristocracy, right? Everyone can learn to program, if you will. Uh, it seems to me both of these are really unrealistic, ultimately. Both, both these are deeply unrealistic, and it seems to me that we really need a much more probing examination of how to begin to bridge this divide in a way, if not recreating the conditions of aristocracy, begins to build new kinds of links between this new aristocracy, especially the kinds of people who were educated at Ivy League schools and work in some of the major urban areas of the country, uh, and those who are kind of left behind, those who live in my part of the, of the country, in the, in the middle part of the country, in the southern part of the country. And unfortunately, I have to say, having now taught at elite institutions for, uh, very fortunately for, for most of my professional life, these kinds of questions and examinations are not happening at these institutions. They are deeply resistant to a, to a kind of potentially challenging examination of what it would take perhaps even to un, in some ways to challenge their own preeminent positions. And it, it's, it does reflect a kind of class bias that we're seeing in these kinds of institutions. But unless this happens, it seems to me liberal democracy is likely to continue to experience these very unstable conditions to the point which we may actually begin to talk about liberal democracy in the past tense, rather than in some ways perhaps something, a kind of alternative that can retain some of the values uh, and some of the benefits we see from, from liberal democracy while minimizing some of its worst effects. All right, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, yeah, perhaps in the, the Q&A, we can get into some of your recommended solutions to these problems. Uh, I recently uh, listened to a talk you gave in DC a while ago on aristopopulism. And I think there's some pretty bracing, radical, uh, but very sensible uh, solutions recommended in that. So. Perhaps one of the midshipmen will bring up the, a question that will elicit uh, some discussion of that proposal. Um, so uh, Dr. Berkowitz is up next. I wanna mention that he was recently the director of the State Department's policy planning staff and the executive secretary of the department's commission on unalienable rights. For those who don't know him, so he's, he's an academic but has been involved in the, the bureaucracy of the federal government recently. I'm sure he's uh, liberated at this point. You, you just you just left that position, as I recall. Is that true? That is a constraint. I'm delighted to be free from, e okay. even as it was an honor to serve. Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> All right, Peter. The floor is yours. Well, thanks very much. It, uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here, um, not only with uh, with the students, with Patrick Deneen, Um uh, and before I, I go any further, I do want to say that um, while I may emphasize some differences between Patrick and me, from the point of view of most any professor of political philosophy in the country, there are no relevant differences between uh, how Patrick approaches the problems at, as do I. We both see liberal democracy in the United States as troubled, profoundly troubled. Um, and we both seek wisdom in the classical tradition and the biblical tradition um, uh, and in Tocqueville and, and in many others to help us understand uh, where we've gone astray and what we can do to, uh, to improve our situation. So um, I thought I discussed this with Edward and I thought it would be useful um, if, I, if I, however, begin not with um, not with the internal challenges to liberal democracy in America, but with an external challenge. I won't, I won't dwell on it, 
Uh, after all, uh, I do agree with um, the young Abraham Lincoln who asked in 1838, when he was 28, in addressing um, Young Men's Lyceum, uh, he asked, uh, where will the biggest danger to the United States, from where will it come? And he answered, it will come from within. That is the biggest danger. I still think that's right. And so um, uh, I think it's very important to engage in the kinds of reflections that, uh, that Patrick Deneen has presented us with. But it's not 1838, it's 2021. And the dangers from within, the dangers to liberal democracy, the disarray all around us, um, those are not the only dangers. Uh, and this indeed is connected to my work as, on the policy planning staff. Uh, another, uh, I want to start with a different danger, an external danger that threatens liberal democracy in America. And that is um, the emergence of the People's Republic of China as, uh, as the preeminent great power competitor for, uh, for the United States. Um, why do I mention this in the context of a conversation about uh, that so far is focused on the internal challenges to liberal democracy in America? Because the contest with the People's Republic of China is not an ordinary contest. According to the conventional wisdom, the People's Republic of China has for 40 years been emerging as a great power, like all great powers. It sought eminence in its region in the Indo-Pacific, the United States has sought to engage China, make it part of the uh, international uh, order, bring it in to the World Health Organization, World uh, Trade Organization, make it um, a responsible stakeholder in the system. What the United States has overlooked is the contest with China turns out to be a contest over the shape of uh, international order, uh, and a contest over ideas. China has become large enough economically, uh, militarily, regards to a technology and regards to its reach into all regions of the world to actually pose a credible threat to, uh, to that international order which the United States helped create after World War II, an international order that's devoted, that's based upon freedom openness and rules has uh, more than a passing connection to the Ameri American commitments to uh, individual freedom and human equality of which, uh, of which Patrick spoke. So uh, uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party, which governs China um, in an authoritarian fashion, has made no bones about its, um, its determination to revise that international order, to make it more friendly to, uh, uh, to Beijing's authoritarian aims and, uh, and authoritarian conduct. So when, we're, when we are thinking about the challenges to liberal democracy, yes, we must pay a great deal of attention to uh, uh, internal, internal decay, but we must also pay attention to this great power competitor. I'll offer just a few more words about it then turn to return to um, uh, the challenge from within. It's wrong to speak of China as an emerging great power. It is an emerged great power. It is a communist dictatorship. The CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, um, governs China on the basis of one party repressive rule. It maintains a massive surveillance state. It has placed more than a million Uyghurs in Xinjiang, Western China, in re-education, that is to say, concentration camps. State Department has found that uh, the crimes against humanity that the Ch Chinese Communist Party are committing against the Uyghurs also constitute a genocide. The Tibetans are also repressed by the Chinese Communist Party. Ethnic Mongolians, more than 70 million Christians, are repressed by China. Indeed, all the people of China are repressed by the Chinese Communist Party. Well, you might say that's a matter for China. What's that got to do with uh, the United States? Um, China has been, has been busy for the last 25 years um, 
through schemes of economic coercion and co-optation, inducing dependence on countries around the world. Every major, the economy of every major, of every major country is bound up with the economy of China, including the economy of, uh, of the United States. China has been working assiduously from within international organizations to rewire them, to infuse them with China's own communist authoritarian norms and standards. And China, and China has also, by the way, uh, has built up a world-class military convention in, in terms of conventional forces, but also in, nuclear, in the nuclear area, in the cyber area, and in, uh, and, and in space. Uh, again, all of that makes, makes China's quest uh, to reshape the international order a credible quest. My own view, this is laid out in a, uh, a long paper that the policy planning staff recently uh, published in November called The Elements of the China Challenge. China's conduct is best understood in terms of China's ideas. In the same way that uh, Patrick has suggested that to understand liberal democracy in the United States, we need to pay attention to the ideas that inform liberal democracy and thinkers like Tocqueville who helped bring into focus conduct in the United States. Similarly with China to understand its conduct at home its, uh, uh, its dictatorship at home and its schemes of um, co-optation and coercion abroad, we need to understand the ideas that are championed by the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. Those ideas are a mixture of dogmatic Marxism-Leninism and hyper-Chinese nationalism. In another context, I'd be glad to elaborate in thinking about the threat that China presents to freedom in the United States. Because by the way, when I spoke of schemes of co-optation and, uh, and coercion in all regions of the world, I certainly meant to include North America. I certainly meant to include the United States. Um, for those of us uh, connected to universities, the rise of Confucius Institutes on the universities are one example. Um, university professors in the pay of the Chinese Communist Party are another example. Hollywood, the NBA, and large co co corporations kowtowing to, um, uh, to uh, the demands of the Chinese Communist Party. Another example of the influence of, uh, of China in the United States. Nevertheless, or I should say, moreover, uh, authoritarianism in China, like liberal democracy in America, this, I will come back to this point, has its endemic weaknesses. We need to pay attention to those. What are the endemic weaknesses of authoritarianism? Well, it tends to be difficult for authoritarian governments to innovate over the long run. Why? Because they crush dissent. It's difficult for them to maintain friendships and alliances. Why? Because they're prone to viciousness and they're untrustworthy. And um, authoritarian governments are costly because it takes a lot of money to suppress the people. Uh, another time we can talk about the specific problems inside uh, the People's Republic of China. To deal with the profound challenge that China represents, it's a profound challenge again because freedom in the United States is very much bound up with preservation of the free and open and rules-based international order. The United States must take a number of steps to secure freedom, policy planning staff uh, concluded. I won't go through them, through all of them, but I will say this. Five of our 10 recommendations had to do with education in the United States. And at the core is the idea that in order to compete effectively with the People's Republic of China, it is essential for the United States to rally around that which is best in the United States of America. That is, the principles of freedom, the American constitutional tradition. Uh, this is where the China challenge to liberal democracy converges with the challenges that Patrick Deneen has been talking about. We won't prevail abroad unless we uh, find a way to strengthen uh, liberal democracy at home. It means a return to our principles. Uh, it means a reinvigoration of civil society 
it means a strong economy. It certainly also means um, uh, maintaining the world's most formidable uh, military. Uh, and it means continuing to champion human rights abroad, notwithstanding our own imperfections, our own defects. A point that, um, was a, that we emphasized in uh, our paper, The Elements of the China Challenge, and a, a point that was emphasized in the report of the Con Commission on Unalienable Rights is, we must always keep in mind, not only for the purposes of foreign affairs, but for understanding uh, the challenges we face at home, we must all, always keep in mind the all important distinction between a liberal democracy, which is based on, the based on principles of freedom and equality, which always fall short of their principles and authoritarian governments that reject out of hand the idea of the dignity of every individual in which liberal democracy is founded. Liberal democracies will always fall short, but as long as they're organized around those principles, uh, they remain um, worth, worth defending, worth fighting for. Um, let me turn now uh, to the internal challenges. In a way, um, where, uh, the leading challenge today, I think, to liberal democracy in America is um, what you could call, I, I group a number of phenomena under the category of the 1619 Project. That will be familiar to all of you, published in the New York Times um, in the summer of, I guess, 2019. It argued that the essence of the United States was slavery. 1619 is the year that the first um, slaves from, uh, black slaves from uh, Africa were brought to um, what became the United States of uh, America. Further, the 1619 Project argued that th this is the true founding, 1619, because the, um, the true essence of the U United States is slavery, and that indeed, even in 1776, Americans were fighting for their freedom from Great Britain in order to preserve the institution of slavery in the United States. Um, one could say also, so that's a, a critique of America at the roots. You could say that there is another critique of America at the, at the roots. Um, let's call it the 1689 Project. According to the 1689 Project, um, the true founding of America, true founding of liberal modernity, is with the publication of John Locke's Two Treatises of Government because inscribed in John Locke's liberalism are, uh, is a deeply destructive view, which, uh, which Patrick Deneen was discussing. The, uh, the view that the true form of freedom for which indeed the United States stands or the, the inner truth of that freedom is the quest for a complete and uh, total freedom, a pure and unmitigated freedom, a freedom from all constraints. And that freedom, the quest for that freedom is profoundly destructive of a truly human life because a tru truly human life um, is lived with a variety of constraints. Um, constraints coming from uh, sense of our knowledge of our duty, understanding of virtues, um, uh, life within a community, and, and more. These are two very serious challenges to the proper understanding of liberal democracy in America. And it seems to me uh, both are based on misunderstandings of our uh, tradition. And I'll try to, um, in just the next five or 10 minutes, try to suggest uh, what I regard as a, a more more adequate understanding. But first I want to acknowledge uh, the important truth in each of the critiques. Yes, the institution of slavery disfigured the American experiment in ordered liberty from the beginning. Uh, and yes, it's true that there are tendencies within the modern tradition of freedom as Tocqueville 
um, and many other thinkers help us understand which when taken to an extreme, encourage individuals to pursue a kind of complete and supreme freedom, total emancipation from every kind of constraint, including the constraints of family, tradition, inheritance, so that we are become self-making uh, self individuals, radically self-making individuals. But to use a kind of abbreviated formulation, um, uh, Nietzsche, postmodernism are not the truth of the liberal tradition. They represent a radicalization of tendencies that are not only within the liberal tradition, but actually within the human heart, within the human soul. I, I, I remind you all that it's in uh, chapter three of Genesis that, um, uh, that God determines to expel um, the man and the woman, Adam and the woman from the Garden of Eden uh, because they become like gods knowing of good and evil. And now, uh, now it is said, they will eat from the tree of life and become immortal, a kind of supreme and complete freedom. Apparently that desire is always with us. It is not um, exclusive to liberal democracy, even as the tendencies within liberal democracy that can, uh, that can exacerbate it, which only goes to show that liberal democracy, that what is true of all regimes, as Plato and Aristotle teach us, is true of liberal democracy. All regimes, every single one we learn from the classics, um, contains the seeds of its own uh, destruction. All regimes we learn from the classics uh, are inclined to take their principles to an extreme. And therefore, in all healthy regimes, the most urgent political task is preserving the regime's principles by providing an education that in a certain sense uh, goes against uh, that tendency to the extremes, that tempers the regime's tendency to, the, uh, tendency to go to the extremes. Having said all that, just a few more straight comments um, uh, building on what, uh, what Patrick has said. Um, I agree about um, freedom and equality be, being bound up within liberal democracy. Liberalism stands for freedom, democracy for equality. But if one turns to the founding of the modern tradition of freedom, especially with Locke, but we could take others, um, we could look at Jefferson. Actually, freedom and equality within the modern tradition are always thought together. Locke, for Jefferson, for our Declaration of Independence, human beings, to, to say that human beings are by nature free is to say that they are equally endowed with unalienable, with inalienable rights. That doesn't remove the tension between freedom and equality, but it says that they're thought together even before you come to the, the form of regime, popular government based on the consent of the governed, which secures rights. Freedom and equality are deeply bound together. And this in a way is what makes modern liberal democracy uh, distinctive. We did, the modern tradition didn't invent the idea of, uh, of freedom. It didn't even invent the idea that the purpose of government is to secure freedom. But unlike the world before it, what distinguishes liberal democracy is the idea that, that, that everybody by nature equally shares in this freedom and it's the job of government to secure it. And by the way, for Locke, for Madison, for Edmund Burke, the key, the understanding of freedom is not freedom from all constraints. Uh, I agree entirely with Patrick Deneen about uh, the destructiveness of that pursuit. For them, quite clearly, and by the way, for, uh, for modern classical liberals like Hayek and Friedman as well, the core idea of freedom is freedom from the arbitrary 
authority of government or other human beings. Uh, another way of understanding um, the modern notion of freedom, the essential meaning, though there are other colloquial forms and there are degraded meanings, is Jefferson's understanding. No human being was born to be ridden, ridden like a horse by other human beings, and no other human being was born to ride other human beings. In this fundamental moral respect, we are all, we are all equal. It's the job of government to capture that respect and, uh, and to defend it. Um, I think uh, Patrick has uh, offered some very wise words, um, drawing on Tocqueville about the rise of a new aristocracy uh, within the United States, which is uh, in some ways more cut off, more uh, cut off from the people than, uh, than old, older aristocracies. James Burnham already in the 1940s and 1950s has been right, was writing about the rise of a managerial bureaucracy. Before that, progressives actually uh, in the early 20th century dreamed of the creation of a disinterested, um, uh, highly educated um, set of technocrats would, who effectively would govern for us, re re relieve the rest of us who are, who are less capable uh, from, from governing ourselves. So in addition to Tocqueville's analysis, there are um, um, other factors that have contributed to the rise of a new aristocracy, which as Patrick suggests, also feels guilty about, uh, about itself and, uh, and has created this divide between itself and the people. And by the way, this is not merely an American problem. Uh, this is a problem, this opening up this new, this new kind of divide or a divide between a new kind of democrats, a new kind of aristocracy and a new kind of people uh, can be seen also in the politics of Great Britain. It can be seen in France, it can be seen in Italy, it can be seen in Hungary and Poland. It can be seen in uh, Israel. Uh, my own view is that um, as is often the case, um, insights that, uh, that Tocqueville um, shared with us uh, in the first third of the 19th century about democracy in America are highly impertinent to understanding democracy, the democratic era in which we still live in the, uh, in the 21st century. So let, let me close with a final uh, a remark about, a uh, general remark about uh, populism. Um, <clears throat> at least in the conservative movement, there has always been a populist uh, development. And I say the conservative movement within the broader tradition of modern liberalism. Edmund Burke being in a way the founder of uh, modern conservatism uh, in response to the beginning, you could say, of modern progressivism in the French Revolution. Burke sought uh, an alliance in effect or sought to defend the common sense wisdom, the inherited wisdom of the English people against the bad ideas about freedom that, uh, that had been developed in France and that he feared were going to migrate across the, uh, the channel. His belief was the ordinary people of Britain knew all they needed to know, but about what? About political freedom from a tradition almost a thousand, uh, a thousand years old. And for a long time, uh, conservatives in the United States said that in response to the decadence of the elites, we need to turn to the people who remain repositories of, uh, of a kind of moral wisdom. Well, at, at this stage in the United States, it is, it is reasonable to wonder where the proper, where the repository is of moral wisdom and moral, moral health. My, my own view is that uh, even, or particularly for this, this quandary, the United States uh, in general is, uh, is more in need of a, uh, of a liberal education 
by which I mean an education for freedom than ever. Uh, can't try to spell it out now, but I'll just say this. For me, liberal education does not begin in college. Liberal education is the kind of education a liberal democracy is entitled uh, to encourage for citizens. And that liberal education begins with literacy, learning to read and numeracy, learning to add and subtract, multiply and divide. It involves a study of the country's own traditions, a fair, reasonable study. It branches out into an understanding of the larger tradition of freedom, the study of one's own civilization, and the study of uh, other civilizations. In other words, it's an education that begins very young and it culminates, I really shouldn't say it culminates in college, it intensifies if we're lucky in college, it culminates with a lifetime of uh, study. That's not all that's necessary. Uh, a lot more can be said about specific policies. I trust we'll uh, get into that now, but uh, I do think that a, recover, a recovery of a proper understanding of education is a crucial component of, of uh, any salutary response to our, um, our uh, troubling situation today. I'll stop there. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, I, if you don't mind, uh, Patrick, we'll just get into some questions um, from the midshipmen's because they're, uh, and, they, and they're to both of you and there's some really good ones. Uh, I'm gonna start with uh, a question offered by uh, midshipman uh, Waranimi and Midshipman Donahoe and Midshipman Blanchard, they basically ask uh, different forms of the same question, which is, uh, I'm gonna read from uh, Midshipman Donahoe. It seems that the forces inherent to liberal democracy will always work against uh, the ties that bind human beings together and allow us to hold a common view of the common good. Um, so that reversing the, the trend may uh, require significantly changing the system do you think such a deep structural change is necessary or can it be avoided? And he liked your book and he recommends it to everyone. And uh, a similar similar question uh, from Mitchum and Warnimi. I'm just reading it and uh, yeah, is it still possible to rebuild links of culture between the new aristocracy and the people without an unrealistic expectation of returning to previous cultural morals that were the product of the pre-liberal inheritance? So he's read your book too. and. Uh, so first to Patrick on that, and then to Peter, who could perhaps explicate a little bit more about uh, liberal education. That's great. Thank you very much for those questions, and thanks for liking my book. I, I really appreciate that. It's the dream of a, any, any author, and certainly a professor, that students read your book without even necessarily having it assigned, or if it's assigned, that they like the book and don't hate the author. Uh, so yeah. thank you for that. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's a great question, obviously, and uh, you know, it's not a it's not a coincidence that at the end of my book, I kind of, you know, I, I, I duck that question in part because it's obviously so, such a titanic uh, and difficult kind of um, challenge, right? Having, having engaged in, uh, you know, what, what really what Peter suggested uh, so, so aptly, which is to recall, and really I think to read my book is just to understand I'm just, I'm just kind of ripping off Plato and Aristotle and Tocqueville among others recognizing that every regime contains the seeds of its own self-destruction as uh, you know, Peter is a, uh, is a good student of the classics and, and I read them and teach them every year. And so this is, this is kind of a constant refrain in the great classic authors that if the, there's no perfect regime, every regime has its strengths and its weaknesses. And, and Peter was suggesting you can look at China today and you can see its strengths, but also you can recognize its weaknesses and what could eventually take it down. Right now we're faced, you know, we're in a more advanced age, you could say. And so the kinds of the, the, the same way that a, that a human body will manifest its weaknesses as you get older, uh, something not to look forward to necessarily, but, but inevitably uh, is, is, I think we're seeing that much more so than obviously I think China is seeing its weaknesses right now. Uh, and the problem is always um, without, it seems to me the rather unrealistic uh, prospect of changing the system in a wholesale way. Uh, that's, uh, I, I consider myself to be something of a conservative and uh, that's, that's, that's a revolution. You're asking for a revolution, a fundamental change in a political order. And I think not only is that um, 
uh, unlikely. Uh, it's simply just uh, there's very little proof in human history that that can be achieved. But it's also unwise. Uh, it tends to the costs of that tend to be so excessively massive, uh, as we saw during a, a variety of revolutions. The French Revolution was mentioned. The Russian Revolution, uh, the Communist Revolution. We we could you know, we we could begin to just describe those and, and describe those in terms of the body counts uh, that those revolutions and effort to tr transform a society. Uh, it was believed that that was required. But I do think, um, and here I, I think I'll disagree with with Peter which is, I guess, turnabout is fair play, uh, that um, in many ways, the modern era, and I'll go back to someone like John Locke, did in fact invent a new idea of freedom. Or let me put it this way. They put, a new, they put an old label on an old idea that was not previously called freedom. So what he describes Adam and Eve doing in the Garden of Eden, uh, seeking to be like gods by eating from the fruit of the, of the tree, uh, or what the classical authors, Plato and Aristotle, uh, would have called actions, especially undertaken by the tyrant, to do whatever one wants. That's, that's, that's the condition of the tyrant, is to, is to act in ways without kind of restraint, act completely outside of any law or limitation. This condition was not described as freedom in this tradition. This condition was described as slavery. Right? This, is, this is to be in the condition of, of servitude and it's not, not that you're necessarily in the condition of being a slave to another human being, you're a slave to the baser part of your own self, uh, that you are subject to the limitless appetites that define the human being. And I think that's part of what the, garden of, the story of the Garden of Eden tells us, that human beings have limitless appetites and we will never be free of those appetites in a sense unless we learn to govern them unless we learn the governance of the baser part of our nature. And this is the consistent teaching throughout both the classical Greek tradition, the best of the Roman tradition, and certainly the biblical tradition, both Old and New Testament. You can read Paul, you can read the sayings of Jesus, and constantly this, this kind of interplay of the idea of liberty and slavery is reverse, it, it, it's really the reverse of how we understand those concepts. And really what the modern era does, and I would, I would point to figures like John Locke in this, is to redescribe freedom. In fact, what John Locke, here's, here's Locke uh, from the uh, second treatise on government. He describes the state of nature as the condition of freedom. He says that it's the state of perfect freedom. Liberty is that condition in which we order our actions and dispose of our possessions and persons as we see fit within the bounds of the laws of nature. That's an important proviso without asking leave or depending upon the will of any other man. So that freedom now is at least within the bounds of nature. And I think here is a very tri tricky and ticklish problem what we get with Locke, which what are the bounds of nature for Locke? But at any rate, that, that freedom is the, is the lack of an external obstacle to doing as we wish. And I think it needs to be stressed that in the classical tradition, in the Christian tradition, this, this understanding of freedom is really not in the forefront. The condition of freedom is when you have learned to govern yourself, kind of discipline the lower and baser part of yourselves, or as a society, learn to govern yourself as citizens, together through the actions of citizens enacting laws that then we in turn uh, obey and follow, right? What Aristotle describes as the citizen is the person who rules and then is ruled in turn, simultaneously governing and being governed. That's what it is to be a citizen. And this to me is what the essence, of course, of what a liberal arts education is or what a liberal education is in the traditional understanding. It's the learned condition of being a self-governing individual over my own self and self-governing together as a, in a political community. It's not, uh, it's not, it doesn't partake uh, essentially of that modern understanding of freedom, which I think is now increasingly seen in the modern form of the humanities, which is to be free of everything, right? It's to deconstruct everything. Right, what we now think of as the liberal arts today have been completely corrupted by this modern notion of freedom. Postmodernism is its sort of it's its is its most intense form of expression. So here I would say is what we don't need is a revolution. We don't need to change the mode of government. What we actually need is to either to restore, or perhaps what we, the way we should think of it is is to take back what was originally our word the word for liberty, the word for freedom, the word liberal, which has a noble origin, but has been corrupted by a modern understanding of freedom. And I, so I think less important in some ways is the systemic condition, which is of course extremely important, 
But the most important thing is how do we understand freedom and the relationship of freedom, both in terms of how we think of ourselves as individuals and how we interact with each other in both social and political forms. And if that could be affected, if that fundamental change of understanding could be affected, an awful lot would follow from that fundamental change. Now that might in itself be revolutionary, but it would be the original form of revolution, which is to go back to, right? How the way that a, a tire revolves. It wouldn't be to try to break from something in the past. It would be in some ways to recover something that actually is in our tradition. Uh, and to which we can lay claim and have every right to claim it. Thank you, Peter. There's a lot there. You're still muted. Sorry, That's can you hear me now? I got to, to a significant extent, uh, I agree with uh, the form of freedom that Patrick praises, but, but I must say, and Patrick knows this, um, the very passage that he read from Locke contradicts his interpretation of Locke. He stumbled over uh, the limitations imposed by the law of nature, but that's a real limitation in Locke. In fact, in the same section, Locke says uh, that we are limited in what we can do in the state of nature. We can't take our own lives, for example, because we are the workmen of God. Moreover, as I suggested earlier, the kind of freedom that John Locke is interested in is the freedom from the arbitrary will of another human being. That is unjustif unjustified exercises of power, not all exercises of power. That's why Locke writes and what Patrick read, without depending, perfect freedom that is without depending on the will of other men. The perfect freedom that Locke is speaking about is not complete and supreme freedom. It's limited freedom. Now this is, now I want to uh, address the questions. This is relevant because we have to understand the kind of freedom that the, the larger liberal tradition is devoted to. It's the, the purpose of government is to secure that freedom. That freedom is thought of in terms of rights. Those rights represent limitations on government action, limitations on the government uh, action of others. They are designed as Locke brings out in his letter concerning toleration, which has to do with your duties to God limitation comes out in Locke's book, Some Thoughts Concerning Education, an entire book John Locke wrote about virtue and how to cultivate them. Um, by the way, to restrain desire. Liberal democracy, the liberal tradition, liberal democracy as it's understood in the American tradition is designed to give great scope for individuals to pursue community, friendship, faith as they understand it. So um, Patrick has written eloquently about the ways in which liberal democracy in America ha uh, has its developed um, dissolves these bonds, following in the footsteps of great figures like um, Tocqueville, but it should also be said like Plato and Aristotle, who wrote about how democracy in the classical era dissolve such bonds. Because really, after all, um, uh, I return to what I, what I said earlier, the, the quest for total freedom is not unique to liberal democracy. And the idea of becoming enslaved to one's own desires is not unique to it. Plato and Aristotle point out that that's a feature of classical democracy, uh, of democracy in their age. Liberal democracy in America is designed to create political freedom so men and women can pursue community as they understand it. At the same time that forces are afoot in the nation. Today, 2021, encouraging people to isolate themselves, to live only for themselves, to understand themselves as their own makers. That same liberal democracy provides room for men and women to, let's say, leave the big city of Washington, DC, find a haven in the Midwest where they can uh, raise their families and cultivate communities uh, at, and pursue the virtues and the good life uh, as they see appropriate. In, in other words, still in the United States, still if you ask yourselves, if you've, if you've been fortunate enough to have a good education, 
and you've come to believe that there's wisdom in Plato and Aristotle and in, uh, and in um, our, our inherited religious traditions, the writings of Tocqueville and others, and you want to live a life in accordance with their understanding, would you say to yourselves, aha, I need to get up and move to uh, communist China or authoritarian Russia or um, theocratic Iran or socialist Venezuela? No, you would say the United States of America for all of its faults today, for all of its defects, and that accidentally because the kind of regime it is still provides more opportunity to cultivate the virtues, to form communities. Now, again, in, in the final analysis, um, my, my argument, we can set aside the interpretation for John Locke for a moment. On questions of public policy, I think I come back to um, uh, where, where Patrick is. In other words, um, therefore, we need to find policies consistent with our regime's principles, which begin with a commitment to uh, the freedom and equality of all, we need to find policies that are friendly to the cultivation of virtue, the, maintain the maintenance of community, religious toleration. Now, in my own view, in many cases, that's going to mean not more government, but less government in order to give individuals and their communities the opportunity to prosper uh, in, in light of their own understandings. I'll stop there. I have a feeling that Patrick might want to respond. No? Well, I, you know, I, 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 I'm happy to respond, but I also want to make sure we leave time. I know we're, we're getting short on time. I, I guess I'll just, just say one thing very quickly. Uh, I, I think Peter is right in one sense, but I think it also reveals the sort of internal, I, 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 I dare say, contradiction, or certainly um, the tension within the liberal idea of freedom that he just laid out. I think it's exactly right that, uh, that liberalism, one of, its, one of its core features is to provide for us the freedom to pursue community, friendship, and faith as he's described. And he's also described liberalism as a, a freedom that frees us from arbitrary governance, arbitrary governance of some entity over us. And you could say that at its heart, liberalism in some ways plays on these sort of two aspects. On the one hand, the freedom to pursue the, the kinds of associations, the way of life, the form of community, the religion, the religious tradition, uh, the forms of friendship uh, that are, are most suited or best suited to us. But let's recognize that community, of course, at, at least in its most essential form, can and often does exercise a kind of authority. And it can be, in some ways, arbitrary because I may not have picked that community. I may not have, may not have chosen to be in that community. Now the American tradition is then you get up and you go to another community, one that's more amenable to you. But we can keep taking this logic down and you can eventually take this logic down to the family, right? The core, you could say the core, right? What's called in the Catholic church, the first society. Well, here's an arbitrary community I didn't pick. I didn't choose the members of my community. I don't get to pick my father and mother. They don't get to pick their children. And at its core or base, there's going to be eventually a kind of deep tension between any form of human community, even that most foundational, the human family and that other foundational community in a sense, that relationship between human beings and God. And we should note that liberal democracy today finds itself in a deep divide over whether or not liberalism is above all about defending the family, the sanctity of the family and the sanctity of religious belief, or is liberalism about defending our ability to be free from the arbitrary authority of religion and the arbitrary authority of the family. This is not illiberalism fighting liberalism at some level. This is liberalism fighting within itself. And I fear, or let's just say, uh, it's, I, I suspect uh, and fear uh, that there's a kind of internal tendency within liberalism that will lead it eventually to turn on the very things that it claims to be defending as we've seen uh, taking place more and more commonly uh, in, in our society today. So, the, so what Peter presents in many ways as a kind of, you know, kind of problem-free form of liberty actually eventually in some ways turns in on itself and consumes itself. Yeah, because I, yeah, I hear you having very different opinions about this internal tendency. You both emphasize education for virtue, but I think Patrick's uh, 
analysis says that there's something about uh, individualism, the freeing of everyone um, that promotes ethical voluntarism and therefore kind of prevents this education and virtue forming process from doing the work it needs to do. Right. Um, and of course it also yeah, undermines the institutions yeah. that do that. Um, actually the only, the, uh, only difference is actually slight, both slight and large. Um, I, I do not deny for a moment that internal uh, tendency. In fact, over the years, over the decades, I've emphasized it myself. Um, my, my argument is that um, that internal tendency, the tendency to radicalize principle is one endemic to all regimes as Patrick's agreed. And that uh, the lesson from classical political philosophy for that matter from Tocqueville is that having recognized this uh, internal tendency, the tendency to radicalize the conception of freedom that we see in the beginning, uh, our job is to find ways to temper that tendency for fear of, uh, for fear of uh, the revolutions that Patrick has, has spoken about. So, um, so actually what, when pressed, I'm not, it's, it's not clear to me how large the, uh, the, the difference is. I don't mean for a moment to uh, suppress or gloss over that tendency. Again, maybe this is a difference. For me, it represents not the essence, but a rad radicalization. And our job, including through liberal education, is to temper that tendency by, um, by, by teaching the truth about the liberal tradition, the complexities of human nature. And by the way, the, the destructive internal tendencies that are built not merely into any particular regime, but the destructive internal tendencies that are sewn into the very fabric of human nature. Uh, here's, here's a question for, uh, for Peter. Uh, could you describe the purpose and conclusions of the Commission on Unalienable Rights? I heard it was controversial. <laughs> well, you heard correctly. It was, <laughs> it was uh, controversial. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, the commission was created in 2019 by Secretary Pompeo. It was created because he perceived a great deal of confusion uh, in human rights discourse. Um, human rights were being criticized by the left as an imperial project. They were actually being criticized by, by the right. As a, uh, as a vehicle to impose progressivism, uh, not only in the United States, but around the world. And, and, and Secretary of State Pompeo had a strong um, conviction that I believe was um, um, cultivated in him when he was a student at Harvard Law School and found as a mentor uh, a, a distinguished figure named Marianne Glendon who was his teacher and became, was appointed chair of the commission, that human rights are somehow uh, deeply rooted in the American political tradition and therefore are a part of American foreign policy, even as we've gone astray in a variety of ways. So the mandate of the commission was, was twofold. One, to reconstruct America's distinctive tradition of human rights. That is the rights that inhere in all persons. Jefferson called them unalienable rights, inalienable rights. And second, to examine the commitments that the United States took on in 1948, when we voted to ratify the Universal Declaration of, uh, of Human Rights. Um, again, Two more minutes, i just say that the, the report has three parts. The first part um, uh, looks at the American tradition and we make an argument that will be familiar to some of you that indeed we look at the declaration, we look at um, the constitution, we look at the fight over slavery, the civil war, the struggle for women's rights, the civil rights movement. We make the argument that a commitment to universal rights is at the core of the American tradition. We agree with Abraham Lincoln that what distinguishes the American founding is the first time ever, ever that a country was founded in dedication to a universal principle. 
and that the history of the United States can be seen as the effort to live up to this principle. The second part deals with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948. We do something novel, which is to uh, go back, read it, attempt to understand the text, hi history, and structure. Um, and it turns out that when that's done, America's obligations are, um, uh, uh, are demanding but narrower than is commonly supposed. And in the last part of the, um, the report, we lay out some of the new challenges to, um, to human rights uh, in foreign policy, and then in a, um, I guess, the, the truly concluding uh, section, um, we lay out uh, fine, concluding observations, the last one of which will uh, ring a bell for Patrick. We speak of uh, seedbeds of human rights, and we uh, argue that the law is not enough political proclamations are enough for the United States over the long haul to properly and effectively champion human rights, which are um, inscribed in our tradition, it will be necessary to um, uh, reclaim liberal education and nurture families, communities, where uh, a respect for the dignity of human beings uh, is originally born and out of which it develops. Okay. That, that final report, uh, it's online too, right? You know? it, uh, it, is, uh, it is online if you Google, uh, if you search for report commission on unalienable rights, yes. Okay, thank you. Well, one last question since the midshipmen even on snow days have things to do and I know Patrick has a class he has to uh, teach. So uh, last question, probably for both of you, uh, paraphrasing Taiwan, and South Korea are liberal democracies that don't seem to be plagued by some of the problems that we are. Is there something about their cultures, perhaps Confucianism, that has served as an anecdote to the liberal democratic problems uh, that are internal to them? Yeah, I mean, I, this it's a great question. I, I actually you know, probably have to defer it to some extent to Peter uh, who uh, I mean, whose comments in the first instance were really much more um, oriented toward international questions. Yeah. But, you know, it does seem to me that um, the the you know the, the origin of the tradition that we're talking about, political philosophy, it, its deepest origins is comparative political thought. Right. It's it's uh, it's genuinely and deeply interested in what it is we can learn from other cultures and civilizations. And I I, I want to agree with Peter's. Uh, Peter's suggestion uh, that that a liberal that a good liberal education is, you know, on the one hand, has to be based and grounded in one's own tradition, and that tradition is, of course, both very long and it's also very contested, as as we've been discussing here today. I mean, we we disagree about how we understand someone like John Locke, but we don't disagree that he's a pivotal figure that we have to grapple with and we have to understand, and our students rightly should be able to grapple with. Uh, and perhaps come away with different understandings, but you better grapple uh, with a thinker like John Locke if you want to be truly liberally educated. Yeah. But beyond one's own tradition, one has to also, um, as you know, Aristotle did, which was to collect the constitutions of the ancient Greek world. Unfortunately, we only have one of those, the Constitution of Athens, which is a pretty good one to have. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but he saw that in order to really genuinely understand the sort of range of possibilities in politics, uh, that we could, we had to look beyond what we understood to be the norms uh, and the ways in which we, in which we we understood politics based on our own tradition. Now, at the same time, one does this, one has to recognize the limitations that any tradition can offer to our tradition, uh, because I, I think the question is right. It might be based in Confucianism. I actually don't know enough about this tradition, which, of course among other things, has a deep and profound stress upon what Tocqueville describes as, as an aspect of aristocracy, the idea of, of being linked and bound, generational, and in particular, a kind of deference uh, to the ancients, uh, to the elderly, to those who have come before us, and the wisdom, accumulated wisdom of elders. And if, if, if I think uh, both Peter and I could agree that one aspect of being a kind of inheritor of the Lockean tradition is that that aspect is not built into the Lockean tradition. Right? We're not supposed to have a kind of deference to tradition. Tradition might be one form of arbitrary governance over my ability to act freely. So there's going to be a tension between looking to these traditions, understanding them, 
and then perhaps being able to draw some, in some ways as correctives, there's probably going to be some obstacles. But nevertheless, I mean, I do think we should be looking to these kinds of these kinds of examples of liberal democracy, even recognizing the kind of limits that they might offer to a very tr uh, different tradition such as ours. In, in this sense, one last final word, I do think one very important thing we need to be doing, and I, and I think we've been doing this today, is to understand that our tradition is multivocal. It's, uh, it's, it's not just simply one thing. It's a, it has a variety of voices, and which voices kind of tend to dominate will differ from time to time. Right. At some periods of our time, we might be more Burkean. At some periods of time, we might have to be you know, sort of more Lockean. Uh, but we have this, we have this tradition. Uh, and in order, in some ways, to do the thing that I think Peter and myself both would recommend, which is to try to correct the seeds of our own self-destruction by a kind of corrective that, that pushes against those tendencies, our best resource are actually re resources within our tradition. Uh, we don't necessarily have to move outside of our tradition as valuable as that can be. The question is, how available are those to us? Right now, Peter and I, I think, are in violent agreement that we need a revitalization of liberal education. But as far from where I'm sitting, in the, in the sort of bosom of the modern research university, uh -huh. so that, does, that does not seem to be forthcoming in the near or even middle future. Uh, so how it is we try to revitalize liberal education in an age when the entire education industry seems to be dead set against uh, the kind of education we're talking about is a genuine and deep challenge that we, that, that we face among others, among many others. Uh, very briefly, um, I, I sign on to every word and punctuation mark in, in Patrick's uh, last set of comments, uh, both about the crisis of liberal education and, um, and his uh, strong endorsement of ultimately comparative politics is the only serious form of political studies, whether it's ideas or, or institutions. You can't start with everything all at once, but the complete education certainly, com certainly has to culminate with uh, a serious uh, study of other kinds of governments, other civilizations. Um, to the specific question, um, you know, Plato, Aristotle, uh, Tocqueville, for that matter, Hayek and Friedman are in agreement. Um, more important than laws and institutions, any political society are the um, beliefs, the understandings, the manners, the mores, uh, the habits of heart and mind that inform those institutions. So um, uh, my hypothesis is yes, um, you don't see the, the, the specific kinds of disruptions in South Korea in Taiwan that you see in, uh, in Western style liberal democracies in part because of a different culture, but also in part because of a reason that, um, uh, that Patrick also alluded to. They're very young democracies, hmm. um, uh, means give them time. But uh, I do wanna add one other point though about, uh, about the importance, both the importance of Confucian civilization and the danger of drawing um, uh, superficial, uh, superficial conclusions. Because uh, again, I think there is a connection between uh, Con Confucian civilization and the style of democracy in South Korea and Taiwan. But the way you usually hear the argument these days is, of course, China, the People's Republic of China is authoritarian. After all, it arises from notwithstanding the Marxism Leninism of the Chinese Communist Party, it arises from a Confucian civilization. And I can assure you that normally in debates and foreign affairs, what you have to do is remind people, well, that can't be the only explanation because look at Hong Kong, look at Taiwan, look at South Korea, look at Japan. All of these are cultures that owe a great deal to, uh, are, are not less steeped in Confucian civilization, and they've gone in a different path. That's why it's important to distinguish the Chinese people from the Chinese Communist Party. So um, I, I'll stop there with this. We, we need a great deal more study of, um, of the culture that underlies politics in the People's Republic of China, and the culture that underlies politics, the political regime in Taiwan and uh, South Korea, 
that study is uh, part of the, um, the greater good of uh, liberal education. Um, we have a lot of work to do. Thank you. Right. Well, good. Well, well, thank you both uh, for your, your generosity and your insights into really complicated challenges that the military needs to understand, uh, especially our future officers. So last March, as we mentioned at the beginning, we were looking forward to hosting both of you at the conference. And I hope we can host you on the yard when normal life returns. So thank you. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was delightful to spend time with you. Thanks very much, Peter. Great to see you. you. And, and thanks to all the midshipmen who, who took time uh, to, to join us and to, and to listen to us today. Good. I echo Patrick's thanks. <laughs>